Welcome to the second video of the Simmond tutorial series. In this video, we'll look at the list mode routine, a routine whereby all the information for every single simulated photon is stored. It's detected position and energy in the scintillator crystal, the number of times it's scattered in the phantom, and its point of origin. Because this information is stored for every photon, the output files are typically huge in the list mode routine. It should be strongly emphasized that the list mode routine is not the routine most of you will use for typical Simmond simulations. It simply contains too much unnecessary data. The main purpose of this tutorial, rather, is to gain essential insight on the spec acquisition process required for properly understanding and interpreting all the parameters in the Simmond user's manual. The list mode routine provides us with the essential data we'll need for this analysis. In addition, I've put a link in the description of this video to a lecture that carefully defines the spec acquisition process. So if you need review on the theory, I'd highly recommend checking that out. As you can see, I'm still in the same Simon Tutorials video folder. Um, I have this uh, analysis2.ipy notebook. Again, this code will be, uh, you can download it from GitHub. I'll put the link in the description to that. And so what we're going to do to start is we're going to copy this point.smc file from tutorial one, and we'll put this in the tutorial two folder. So now we have the uh, sort of Simmond uh, parameter file uh, now in this folder. So like I said, we're now going to look at a different routine. And the last time we looked at the scatter window routine. So this gives spec projections. You can directly open up and you can examine and uh, it's sort of representative of a real spec scan. Uh, today we're going to look at the list mode routine and again the main reason we're going to look at this again list mode files are very large they're not typically used in practice that often but what it gives you looking at the list mode data is an understanding of a spec system that you don't get when you just look at the scatter windows alone and by understanding the spec system in from that perspective you can ultimately do more work in the other routine you'll see what i mean as we start to look at list mode data so the list mode routine is discussed in the Simmond user's manual and the way we change it is by index number 84. So I'm going to change uh, point.smc. Again, this allows us to change the general data and everything. And I'm going to go to index number 84 scoring routine and I'm going to set this 84 equal to 2. So now when it stores the data, it's going to store it in the so-called list mode format. So it's the same simulation that we're running as before. Now we're in list mode form. So the thing about list mode is it contains even more data than the scatter window routine. In fact, you could extract, and we're gonna do this in this video, you can extract all the same information as the scatter window from list mode data. The drawback is that the list mode files are very huge. What they do in list mode is it tracks the information about every single individual photon that was detected, as opposed to doing a sort of binned histogram of all these different images. It's actually gonna tell you for every single photon that was simulated, where it hit the detector, how much energy it deposited, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these parameters you have access to on a real scanner. For example, a real scanner will predict a energy value for a photon. It will predict a given position of the photon. And so we can look at this list mode data here to understand the spec system. So what we'll do is we will uh, basically um, run the point simulation. In fact, what I'm gonna do is, I'm, before I do that, I'm gonna permanently change the parameters uh, index two, I'm going to set index two to three centimeters and index three to four centimeters. I'm also going to change index four to one centimeter. And now I'm going to run the simulation. So I'll clear that and I will simmond point test. So it's going to run the point.smc file. Of course, it's the simmond command and all the files are going to be saved as test. So now it's going to run. And you'll notice that it's going to take a little bit longer than the scatter window routine. Uh, the main reason for that is that it's saving this data to disk and list mode files contain a large number of data. Remember, we're simulating 5 million different photons and it has to save a number of parameters for each individual photon, which we'll sort of dig into in a second. All right, so we just finished running. It took uh, two or three minutes to run. It took a little bit longer than before. Uh, we now have this .lmf file. You know that there's also this uh, result file here as well, containing all the uh, parameters of the simulation. You start to recognize some of them now that we've gone through a lot of the parameters, but again, there's still many we don't know. And the point of looking at the list mode data is we're gonna sort of start to understand what these other parameters mean. So we'll open up the uh, analysis2.ipy notebook file. Again, that is on GitHub. 
and uh, I'll run using the PyTorch kernel again. Um, so here we have NumPy. We're going to open up the list mode data using NumPy. We'll do some plotting. We'll even make a cool animated GIF at the end um, at using the rotate function here. Okay, so we can open up the list mode data as follows. So this LMF file is sort of confusing and it's 1.46 gigabytes. It's a very big file as far as storing data goes. Um, and it's only really recently with computers that we could sort of look at data like this. So it's pretty big. And the question is, how the heck do you open this file to get access to its data? Well, I've written a function here that does that. And the list mode data is stored in a particular format that's sort of gone over by the uh, user manual. So again, I'll, I'll show that on screen right now. Um, but you can see that list mode stores the um, sampled emission points. So for all 5 million photons, it stores the location of where the photon was simulated. Uh, it stores the lo last location of the photon before it exited the phantom, the last interaction point. It saves the X, Y, and Z locations in the crystal. So when the photon gets detected by the camera, the X, Y, Z position on the detector as well. Uh, it stores the energy that the photon deposited in the crystal, or rather the energy that the crystal measured from the photon. Again, a 208 keV photon might not be measured as 208 keV or 140 in our case is not necessarily going to be measured as exactly 140 and there's a few caveats there which we'll get into for sure. Uh, there's the photon weight. The point of that is like before it's a calibration factor which puts the units of that photon into counts per second per megabecquerel. Remember that in the last video all the projection data was stored in those units and so this photon weight allows us to give that units to each individual photon. So it's going to be very, very, very small. Uh, there's also the scatter order. So that's the number of times that the photon scattered in the phantom before it reached the detector. Remember, I gave the example of a photon being emitted, it's scattering and reaching the detector. Well, it can do that one time. It can also do it multiple times before it hits the detector. So we can actually look at the scatter order. Uh, the beautiful thing about the scatter order is that if it equals zero, obviously we can differentiate it as being a primary photon, not a scattered photon. So anyways, we have this .lmf file. So this file, what it does is there's 12 different things here. You'll notice that it's using the from file format because it's a binary format. It's going to store these x naught. So that's uh, a 16-bit integer. And I know that from the sort of uh, data file that I'm showing on screen right now, uh, the, the first coordinates are x. Uh, they're stored as 16-bit integers. Well, then there's the last position in the phantom. Again, 16-bit, 16-bit integer. Uh, finally, you get to the weight, which is stored as a 64-bit float. That's a pretty big data type. Uh, and then finally, the uh, scatter. Well, that's just like usually 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's stored as an 8-bit integer, a bit smaller. So what this will do is if I open my data using this open list mode function that I wrote, uh, I will get my data array. Uh, it's just a NumPy. It's a weird-looking NumPy array. And you can see that each individual row corresponds to a photon with all the parameters that are sort of listed in the table. Okay, so the first thing that's very interesting to look at is the, not so much the position on the scanners, but it's going to be the energy itself. So I have the energy that every individual photon deposited in the detector. And of course, I need to divide by 10 to get units of kilo electron volts. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that every photon that we simulated in this source is, has an original energy of 140 kilo electron volts. But as you can see right here, right away, well, they, they certainly don't all have that energy here. Uh, well, this one is pretty close, but some of them are obviously quite a bit less. So let's actually look at the energy spectrum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bin from uh, 300 different bins. So it's a 1 keV spacing from 0 to 300 keV. So that's going to be the bins of my histogram. Uh, then I'm going to extract the energies as well. So these are all the different energies of all my photons. Um, and then I'm going to get the weights. So the weights give the contribution of each photon in counts per second per megabecquerel. So when I take a scan, basically that says how much each photon is going to relatively contribute to the scan. So I need to use these weights when I bin my histogram. Uh, then I call the np.histogram function where I feed in my energies, my bins, and my weights, which I've extracted from this data here. And I'm, I want the bin, so this gives the bin edges, so it's a slightly larger. Like if there's two or 300 points in N here, there's going to be 301 bin edges. So I just get the center of each bins so that I can plot a spectrum. So this will create a histogram of all the different energies from the list mode file. And I can plot them and I get the following energy spectrum. So the main thing to notice, I've put a dotted line here at 140 keV. You'll note that every photon in this study started with 140 keV. And they sort of go out, 
And when they hit the detector, you measure this weird sort of spectrum here. Now there's multiple components to dig into here. Uh, the first thing to note is that it is peaked at 140 keV. So a lot of these photons are actually detected at 140 keV, but there's all this stuff happening down here. So let's talk about all the different effects that happen here. Well, the first, and I should really call this scatter in the phantom. So this says that, okay, the photon has been emitted inside the phantom and it scatters and then it gets detected. Well, when a photon scatters inside the phantom, it loses energy via Compton scatter. So if a photon goes like this and then scatters and then gets detected, it's going to have less energy. So a lot of these photons here correspond to photons that have scattered with um, less energy. So you could imagine that, okay, you might think, well, there's the primary photons that hit the detector and then the ones that scattered and lost energy. And if I sort of, the, the one will be really peaked at 140 keV and then the scattered ones are gonna be elsewhere. Well, that's not quite true. So by the way, we can look at the scattered photons by looking at the um, S here. Remember that S contains the number of scatters in the photon. So we can wait. So when I wait the events here, I'm just waiting them by the counts per second per megabeck roll. I can multiply weights by like uh, either zero or one. Zero if it's scattered multiple times and one if it hasn't scattered to look only at the primary photons. Um, so that's sort of what I do here. So if I wanna look at all photons, I just take the weights like I did before. Um, and by the way, I'm taking the absolute value here because it turns out the way that Simmons stores the data, if a weight is negative, that actually simulates the next projection. So you'll, you'll recall that we did three different projections. The way that you know that you've now entered the next projection is that the weight is negative, but that you take the absolute value of the weight when you actually weight it. That's just sort of an indexing thing that people can use when they're sort of examining the list mode data on their own. Anyways. Uh, if I want all the, the weights, I would just go like this. If I only want primary weights, I look for anything where the scatter order is less than one, basically zero, it hasn't scattered at all. And if I want scattered events, well then my weights can be weighted like this and I do everything the same as before. And from that I can get my histogram of all my photons, my primary photons and my scattered. Remember primary go right into the detector, scattered ones get scattered and then move into the detector. Okay, so this code took about 11.8 seconds to run. Remember we've simulated 50 million photons they're going into the detector. Some of them have scattered. Some of them have gone right into the detector. I have my uh, spectrum of all the photons, the ones that have just been primary entered the detector and the ones that have scattered. And another thing to remember in real spec systems, you can't differentiate between the primary and the scatters like we're doing here. The only way we could do that right now is because we've run a Monte Carlo simulation where we can track each individual photon. In practice, you don't know whether they've uh, scattered or not, but anyways, We've separated into three different spectros and we can look at the spectrum and we are sort of correct about what's happening here. Okay, so there's this primary bump that corresponds to the photons at 140 keV, but it still has a finite width to it. And then the scattered events, well, they have less energy like we expected. And so they're gonna be less than the actual photo peak itself. And so, okay, we're almost correct, but what the heck is going on down here? We've simulated photon events of only 140 and we're getting energies down here. The other thing is why is there that finite width? You know, if we're emitting photons of 140 keV, we should be detecting them as 140 keV. Well, the first thing to talk about is the width of this peak. That has to do with the energy resolution of the detector. So you note if we go into our parameter file, change point.smc, the first thing you'll note is that there is a energy resolution at 140 keV. So as long as you give the energy resolution at 140 keV, it can interpolate and use the fit function to find the energy resolutions at other energies. Well, in our case, we are at 140 keV and it's set to 10% um, energy resolution. And you'll note that there's another thing called intrinsic resolution in centimeters. This has to do with the resolution of where the photon gets placed when it gets detected. There's an XY uh, location of where it's detected. Well, there's an intrinsic resolution to that as well. There's gonna be error where the photon is actually assigned its position. So what we'll do is we're going to change index 22 to a value of three and we're gonna rerun. Now I could edit the change file right now, but it's actually more efficient here to uh, rerun the command I had before. So sim and point test, I'm gonna call this test two and I'm gonna set index number 22 to 3%. So now it's gonna be a 3% resolution and I can run the scan. All right, so the simulation also took about two minutes. So now we have the higher resolution data with 3% resolution as opposed to 10%. So we can open up the same histograms, but now with the better resolution file, 
And what I'll do is I'll plot the two primary spectra together. So here there's the primary events for the 10% resolution. Uh, we'll show the 3% resolution uh, sort of on top of it. And you can see sure enough that the 3% resolution, you have a much narrower spike here in energies, whereas the 10% one is a little bit uh, wider here. So what it means is that the energies that are detected are more precise by the detector. But again, this is primary photons and you still get a slight bump here. So the question is where the hell does this bump come from? And that actually turns out it's the back scatter peak. Now we've talked about scatter in the um, phantom. So here's the detector, a photon can come and scatter and hit the detector. But we've only talked about scattering in the actual phantom itself. It turns out when the crystal is detected, you need an actual way to find what the energy of the photon is. The way that the photon deposits energy in the crystal is it enters the crystal and, you know, theoretically it deposits all its energy through interacting with the material. But what can also happen is the photon can enter the crystal, so this is after it's exited the phantom, and it can Compton scatter and it can leave the crystal. So it comes in, it interacts with the crystal, and it bounces right back out. Um, so that's what's known as the backscatter peak, a, a particle that comes in the crystal and then sort of backscatters out and no longer interacts with the crystal. And it's out of, you see that the peak is around 50 keV. What does the backscatter peak correspond to? Well, you have 140 keV photons, but don't deposit all their energy in the crystal. They scatter outwards. Um, and they do that through Compton scattering, depositing only a fraction of their energy. Okay, so what is the formula for Compton scattering? The new energy of the photon is equal to the old energy. And then you have this factor, one minus cos theta, where theta is the scattering angle. What that means is the energy deposited in the crystal, which is equal to the original energy minus the new energy of the photon, that's how much energy is in the crystal, energy conservation. Um, when theta is equal to pi, or the greatest possible deposition of energy in the crystal via that Compton scattering interaction is uh, 2e over 2e plus mc squared e. The way you set that is you just set uh, theta equal to pi, you sort of rearrange this equation and you solve for e deposited. So that's the maximum deposited energy through Compton scattering. So that's if it enters and then back scatters out. So we can compute what this value would be. So I have E is 140 keV, mc squared is 511, is my uh, theoretical like maximum deposited backscatter energy. And if I look at my histogram here and I'm scaling it down so I can look at this backscatter peak, sure enough, you see that this peak sort of starts to arise as soon as you reach that backscatter peak of, um, I don't know what the number is, but it's 50 something or around 50. So this backscatter peak is a sort of consequence of that. So you're detecting all these photons in the crystal. Um, some of them are primary events. Some of them have been scattered in the phantom. Some of them are primary events that have deposited less energy. So you have all these different photons that are being detected in your spec uh, system. You know, we've when you set up your scanner, it measures photons, but it assigns an individual energy to each one of these photons that it detects. And from there, you can bin into so-called energy windows, which we'll get into in a second. What I want to talk about now is the uh, spatial binning. What the scatter window routine really does, remember that's index 84, you can see the manual, is it basically, it has list mode data, but it's binning it based on the pixel size, the matrix size, and then also a, we didn't look at this last time, but a dot win file that gives the energy windows to only include events with certain energies. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. What is this window file? So by default, if there is no dot window file, it's gonna sort of go maybe 10% above and 10% below by default, but I can also give individual sort of window files. So for example, in this scan I did here, we ran in tutorial one, we ran the scatter routine function. If I wanted to only keep photons that had a certain energy, so for example, I only want photons in the sort of photo peak range, I wanna ignore as much scatter as possible, I could, for example, create a new file and I give it the same name, so I'd call it point.window, and then I give the energy. So for example, if I'm measuring at 140 keV, maybe I want 130 to 150, and this value of zero, well, ignore that for now, but that just says it's the default. It's, it's only gonna store photons that had the, between these two energies. So that's how you would use a dot window file in the scatter routine. And we'll do that when we do further simulations in this tutorial series. But it also bins by uh, pixel size and the matrix size. We just did these last time. We changed the sort of from 0 0.4 centimeters to 0 0.2 centimeters. We changed from 128 to 256 by 256. But if we have access to the list mode data, we can actually do this ourselves as well. So let's think about how we can possibly do that. Well, so let's think about how we can bin the list mode data ourselves. And this is a really good exercise in understanding how spec data is stored and interpreted really. 
Um, so first of the list mode data stores all the different projections. We did three projections here and we only want to consider a single projection at a time. You'll note from the manual that it gives the X, Y, and Z locations in the crystal, but that's for the detector at a particular rotation angle. We still need to differentiate between the different projections. So I said before that the start of a new projection, uh, this is incorrect, it should be uh, the weight. So when the weight is equal to, when the weight is negative, it's just less than zero. Yeah. When the weight is less than zero, you know that you've started a new projection. So for example, I can look at my data and I can look at the shape of the data and it's sort of this long. This is how many photon events there are. Um, I can look at data W for all the weights. And so some of these are going to be negative and that signifies the start of the next projection. So if I want the indices where this is negative, well, I can sort of open my list mode data like I did here. And I can go mp dot where, what are the locations where data is less than zero? And then indexing here, well, this gives me, if I don't index like that, the split indices sort of return this tuple like that. This just gives me the indices themselves. So at this index, I start a new projection. And then at this index, I start another new projection. Now I really want it so that I know that the projections go between one number to another. So I'm gonna append zero to the beginning of this ray and negative one to the end so that it looks like this. And then if I want the events only corresponding to projection one, for example, I would index between these two values in the array. If I want the next projection, I would index between these two values and then the final one, this to the last value in the array. So I can separate data into different projections by basically going split indices I, so here to here. And I loop through the uh, sort of length. So there's four different things here. It's gonna go zero to this. Then it's gonna go this to this. Then it's gonna go this to this. And it's gonna store it into uh, multiple different data. This is just using list uh, comprehension. So the length of my Ds is three. And I now have sort of all these different list mode data corresponding to each projection individually. So we can encode all of this into a single function that we've done up here. We open our data, uh, we split the indices, um, we set the weights always to being positive, and then we return sort of a separate list mode thing for each projection. And now I have my data as separated as different uh, projections. So I can now look at all the data corresponding only to the first projection angle. So that's the first angle of the camera. I'll call it data zero here. So I can look at data zero. It's just list mode data, but all of it only corresponds to a single projection as opposed to all of them uh, together. And so what I can do is we can now start to bin the X and Y positions on the camera to create something that looks like an image. And so this is where we can sort of set these parameters by ourselves. I can say I want 128 bins and I want a spacing of 0 0.1. And you'll note that the point 0, 0 is at the center of the scanner. So when I create my bins, I bin from sort of negative nx over two times dx. This is the furthest left x spacing, the furthest right x spacing, and then in y as well with my spacing. And I can give any sort of dimensions here I want. Um, but just know that if I look at my bins array, I basically go from uh, negative 6.4 centimeters to 6.4 centimeters. And this is the spacing. So these are the bins that I'm going to bin. So all the photons that are contained between those two values are gonna be sort of summed into one bin. That's like one individual uh, image pixel, for example. So this is gonna be our spatial binning and that's sort of what's done automatically in Simmond when you run the scatter window routine. Uh, we can also make a mask only for the energies that we want. So in our case, we look at the 10% window and maybe we wanna take as many events as possible. And maybe we go from like 126 to 156, for example. I meant uh, 154. So these are gonna be the energy range that we take for the photons. And my mask is gonna be, I only wanna take the data where the energy, and remember that it's stored as 10 times its value, so I need to divide by 10. Again, that's in the Simmond user's manual. Uh, it needs to be greater than emin and less than emax. So this is basically a mask of trues and falses. So every event is either true or false, depending whether or not it was in the energy range or it wasn't in the energy range. And so finally, we can actually bin these. So what I'll do is I'll take my data zero. So these are all the X positions in the first projection. Of course, I need to divide by 100 to get the absolute position. If I take the um, energy mask of this, it will only count the events where the energy lied within that range. Uh, and so this gives me all the, the locations of the events in X that had the energy in the specified range. I do the same thing for Y, and then my weights as well, I'm only taking the weights corresponding to being in that energy range. So that I also index by the energy mask here. And then I basically just use the NumPy histogram 2D function 
where I give my um, X detected and Y detected. So these are all the X locations and Y locations of the detected events. I give my bins and I give my weights. And I now get this counts array. And if I look at the counts array, it's 128 by 128 and we can plot it like this. And you can see that we have now actually binned our projection. It's 128 by 128 and has the desired pixel spacing that we want. It's got units of counts per second per megabyte roll. So now you see behind the scenes exactly what Simmons is doing when it does the scatter window routine. You have all these photons being detected with different positions and different energies, but if you bin them by position and only look at certain energies, then you can store sort of the data like this. Now it is possible as well that we could bin a little bit wider. So if I took my total spectrum here and I made sort of the uh, energy cutoff a little bit lower, it would include more photons, but a lot of them would be scatter photons. Okay, so we'll put this all into a single function. So this is basically what we did before. Uh, I can just open up a file path. It's gonna take uh, minimum and maximum energies and then the uh, spacing for the histogram. Uh, the only difference is that rather than doing it for a single uh, projection, it's now gonna loop through all the different projections. So all the, all the code here is the same as before. I'm now just looping through all the projections. I'm appending to this list of projections, which I then convert into an array. So it does all the code we did before separately for each projection. Uh, and we can bin our projections however we like with this function, which is really nice. If you have the list mode data, you don't have to rerun the sim in the scan. You can just bin it however you want. So for example, I could bin with different energies or I could bin with different spacing. In this case, I'm doing a high resolution projections and low resolution. So high resolution is gonna have a smaller uh, pixel spacing, 128 by 128. Uh, the lower resolution is going to be 0 0.4, 0 0.4 with 32. So it's going to be the same size, only in one of them, the pixels are a bit uh, larger. They're 0 0.4 centimeters. So I can run this to get my uh, binned projections, and then I can plot. And you can see that I now have this high resolution scan and the low resolution scan. Both of them are in units of counts per second per megabyte roll. Now, one thing you'll notice is that with the finer the bins are, I get less counts per second per megabyte roll because if I am binning by sort of a smaller amount, you're gonna detect less photons in that pixel. Whereas if I have larger bins, I'm gonna measure a lot more photons if I have larger bins. Now you'll note that this looks quite noisy. Again, the huge thing to understand with Simmond, this isn't representative of a true spec scan. This is counts per second per megabecrel like we did in the last video to simulate a real scan. You need to multiply by the total activity injected and the time you measure per projection. So in this case, we'll assume an activity of 50 megabecrels and a time of 15 seconds. Then we can generate a Poisson noise from each of these different scans here. So I'll get my projections with high resolution, the noise and the low resolution, and we'll see what a spec scan looks like depending on the binning that I do. So I can plot and you can see that, okay, the high resolution is super noisy. The low resolution is actually less noisy. So you have this sort of trade off here you can have higher spatial resolution by binning you know, more finely like you do here and retain more information, but at the cost of increasing noise. Whereas with the low resolution, you get less noise because you're measuring more counts per individual uh, pixel. So another thing you can do with list mode data in Simmond, but not in real practice, is you can get access to the original location of where the photons were emitted from. And as you can see in the Simmond manual, those are given by index uh, one, two, and three. So in this case, we can bin sort of like we did before. We don't have to differentiate between different projections because the photons where they came from is independent of sort of, of the projection. Um, but basically I can get my X, Y, and Z emitted points from the data uh, given that I've binned. So by the way, in this case, I'm binning so that I have the same dimensions along the X, Y, and Z axis. But you could refine this a little bit more if you want a different spacing in X, Y, and Z. Uh, I tamp my weights like before, and I can get the emissions. So this is a 3D array with the number of emissions in units of counts per second per megabecrel of every voxel. So I give my X, Y, and Z emitted points. I'm using the D-dimensional histogram. I give my bins, well, it's, it's three times bins. It's gonna be the same X, Y, and Z binning. This is just gonna duplicate bins, bins, bins three times. That's how multiplication works with lists in Python. Uh, and then I give my weights as well to scale it. So I can bin my source with a resolution of 0 0.1 centimeters, 128 by 128 by 128. So from this, I can actually look at what my source looks like. So I can look at the central Z slice. Remember it's 128, so the central Z will be uh, 64. And you can see that my source kind of looks like this. Again, it doesn't tell you too much information what it looks like, but it gives sort of the statistics of the counts per second per megabecrel corresponding to each voxel. And again, it's noisy 
but if you do more and more Monte Carlo simulation, this noise will be reduced. Now you may be wondering why we're looking at this. Well, it's sort of a neat feature that Simmond offers that you can actually get the original location of each uh, voxel. And just for fun, uh, we can actually make a 3D animation of the source. So for example, if I have a 3D object, um, and I won't go too much into this code, basically what I'm doing is I'm rotating the object around and I'm projecting it so I get sort of what looks like a rotating 3D object. Again, if you're more interested in this code, you could look at it, but I can run this and I can actually make a, a GIF file of what our original source looks like. So it's created a GIF animation, source.gif here, and if I look at it, it's sort of like, uh, it's again, sort of what I mentioned, it kind of looks like a flask. So I have my flask object here, these are all the photons and it's sort of rotating around uh, to give a sort of 3D perspective of the object. So this is the thing that we're imaging. Um, of course, the first scanner image is taken sort of directly on top of it if it's laid flat. That's why it kind of looks like a square. And then the scanner, of course, rotates it around. But this is sort of what our 3D object looks like. The reason why I include this code here is because when we actually reconstruct our spec data later, when we take the projections and use those to create a 3D object, we'll do a very similar animation to what we did here. So you'll notice in the simulation that we simulated a source that had an energy of 140 keV only. Now in practice, actual radio pharmaceuticals that you put inside someone's body, they don't just emit photons of a single energy. They might have primarily one energy, but usually they emit photons of multiple energies. And so we can look at different files like that actually in the Simmond uh, SMC directory. So they have these ISD files. These actually give the photon emission spectra of a bunch of different radioactive sources. They have tons and tons stored here. So the reason it's set to 140 keV by default is because technetium 99M is a commonly used radio tracer. And if you look at the abundance of photons, if I look at 140 keV, it's much, much higher than any of the other energies that it emits. So if I only emit photons of an energy of 140 keV, it's a pretty good approximation of technetium, though in reality, technetium is also emitting photons of different energies as well. Now, another radio tracer that's commonly used in SPECT imaging is lutetium-177. So I'll go down here and I have lutetium-177.isd. It has a slightly different spectrum of photon energies. It has sort of this primary emission at 208 keV, but it also has another emission at uh, 112 keV. Uh, with about 60% uh, of what it is at 208 keV. So if you were to do a simulation in Simmons, you might be tempted to do a simulation only with 208 keV photons, just set the energy. But in reality, you want to simulate this uh, tracer, this .isd file. So the way to do that in Simmons, and we're gonna change one other thing, by the way, as well, before we do the simulation, I can use the FI flag, and I'm gonna say lutetium-177. And you'll notice that this file is named lutetium-177 and it's going to simulate that source in particular. Now, before we simulate the source, we're gonna change something else about the camera as well. You'll recall that in a SPECT system, when a photon gets detected, the reason why it's blocked from traveling at different angles is because there's different collimators that stick out of the material that are made of lead that stop photons from entering the detector like this. They only sort of allow photons to enter like that. Now there's still a small chance that photons will penetrate through the lead collimator and be detected anyways. This is shown by the blue arrow here. Now the probability of this occurring is increased for higher energy photons. So the higher energy of the photon, the more likely this is to occur. Now for photons of higher energy, they're going to penetrate the collimators slightly differently. So for example, technetium 99M, which had 140 keV, it has less energy. It's not going to penetrate the collimators as much. Now, if you have a, a radionuclide like lutetium, which is 208 primarily, it's gonna penetrate the collimators a little bit more. So maybe you want to change the collimator. You wanna make them a little bit longer, a little bit thicker to stop the lutetium from sort of going through it. So in a real spec system, depending on what you inject in the patient, you would change the collimator depending on the photon energy emitted by the radio pharmaceutical. And so if I go to this uh, same directory here and I can look at the uh, column.call file, they give all these different um, collimator parameters, diameter, septa, length, hole shape, et cetera, for many different systems that are used in practice. So this is General Electric. Uh, they make a bunch of spec systems with different collimators that uh, they have. So when you actually take this in the clinic, you would go to your spec scan and there are ways that you can take out the old collimators and put in the new ones. They make it very easy, of course, for uh, technicians to do this. Um, now the ones that we use typically in Vancouver, Canada would be the Siemens systems. They're the ones I'm most familiar with. 
And for lutetium, you're gonna look at the Siemens medium energy collimator. This is the most commonly one used for lutetium. So if I'm simulating a scan with lutetium 177, I can also change the collimator parameters by going collimators Siemens medium energy. So this is gonna run list mode data, assuming emissions of lutetium 177 with the medium energy collimator of Siemens scanner. So I can run this. Now the lead blocks that are sticking out have slightly different shapes that are given by this uh, collimator.call file. So I've opened up another terminal wall that's running and I'm going to look at the point.smc file. And you can see that if I go here, um, there's all these parameters here that specify the parameters of the collimator. Now, if I give the CC and then the collimator name flag, um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna ignore all these and use the parameters of the collimator file only. So if I call Siemens medium energy, all these are gonna be replaced with the corresponding values from this file right here. So it's gonna replace all these values uh, with these parameters here. Okay, so we finished running our lutetium 177 uh, simulation. Uh, I'll go back to the analysis here and I've saved it as, so I just finished the um, lutetium 177 command. Uh, it was right here. I noticed that I overwrit my test two. So this was the one we did with had lower resolution. So what I'll do is I'll change this to test two for now. And if I actually look at the um, energy spectrum here, you can see that it's now totally different. So I still have my line for 140 KeV. And I have the 208 KeV peak that I talked about and also one at about 120 or something like that. And so I can break the spectrum in to um, scattered and primary like I did before. Again, I need to make sure I'm running test uh, two here. And sure enough, if I look at my spectrum, you could see my primary spectrum and my scattered spectrum as well. Anyway, so in this video, we've done quite a bit. We've looked at the raw list mode data from a spec scanner, the raw output that you get access to when things are being binned. Uh, we looked at sort of where it's spatially located. We changed the energy resolution of the scanner and we got a slightly more precise spectrum. But in reality, of course, the energy resolution depends on the hardware. That's not something we can change. Uh, we binned the events based on the positions. Again, this is something you could do theoretically in practice with the spec scanner, as long as you had access to the list mode data and we created our own projections. And now you sort of see why the scatter window routine is so nice. The scatter window routine takes care of basically everything we did in this video. It bins things automatically, it separates them into different energy windows, and it reduces the size of the data significantly. If we take raw data and we bin it into a histogram, we reduce the size that we store on disk, and we don't really need all that information. Maybe we only need to know the images for reconstructing. So this is one of the advantages of the scatter window routine, which we looked at last time, and we're gonna only use sort of going forward in this tutorial series. So I hope you enjoyed this video. In the next video, we'll do a full simulation of a JASAC phantom. I'll talk about what that means then. And not only that, but we're going to reconstruct the object and make a 3D animation of the reconstructed spec scan. So I hope you look forward to that. And uh, please like the video if you enjoyed, share with all your friends who are learning to use Simmond, and I'll see you next time.